When you read the biblical book of Psalms sequentially, you might find the arrangement of the book somewhat confusing. The content of Psalm 1, for example, doesn't seem to flow naturally into the content of Psalm 2, and the content of Psalm 2 doesn't seem to flow naturally into the content of Psalm 3, and so on. For this and other reasons, scholars have often tried to group the Psalms into meaningful thematic clusters, sometimes called forms or genres, which can then be studied in those meaningful groups. Since the early 20th century, this way of studying text has been called form criticism. Hermann Gunkel did more than just about anyone else to make form criticism a standard part of a biblical scholar's toolbox. In this video, I'll introduce you to a simplified version of Gunkel's form critical method as applied to the Psalms. According to Gunkel, a group of texts belong together as a form or genre if they exhibit a common style, a common sensibility, and a common setting in life. These criteria for identifying forms or genres can be illustrated with a simple little form critical exercise. Consider this utterance, push them back, push them back, way back. Now consider a second utterance, hit them again, hit them again, harder, harder. You can immediately see that these two utterances exhibit marked similarities of style and or structure. Both unfold in short, punchy phrases chanted in similar rhythms, and both rely heavily on verbal repetition. What about a common sensibility, or as Gunkel put it, a common treasury of thoughts and moods? Again, it's easy to see that the mood, tone, and or content of our two specimen utterances are very similar to one another. Both utterances urge the audience to acts of violence against unspecified others and do so with a rather enthusiastic tone. Finally, do our specimen utterances share a common setting in life? Well, of course they do. Both utterances most commonly occur at football games and most commonly when the speaker's preferred team is playing defense. We can therefore say that these two utterances belong together in the same form or genre category and we might go so far as to give it a name. Let's call it the cheer. Now, by applying more sophisticated versions of these procedures, scholars from Gunkel onward have tried to map out the various forms or genres attested in the biblical book of Psalms. The two broadest categories identified are usually labeled praise and lament. Praise is very easy to recognize. Praise happens when a speaker says something complimentary about God. Praise psalms are often sprinkled liberally with the speaker's invitations for other worshipers to join in the praise as well. Psalm 98 provides a particularly clear example. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gotten him victory. I'll stop reading right there for now, but I encourage you to read the whole thing to get a sense of what praise psalms sound like. Now, modern worshipers are probably less familiar with lament than with praise. But lament is also very easy to recognize. Lament happens when worshipers complain to God that something in their lives, individually or corporately, is not what it ought to be. Psalm 28 is a great example. To you, O Lord, I call. My rock do not refuse to hear me. For if you are silent to me, I shall be like those who go down to the pit. Hear the voice of my supplication as I cry to you for help, as I lift up my hands toward your most holy sanctuary. Now here again I'll stop reading after those two verses, but I encourage you to pause the video and read the rest of Psalm 28 to get a feel for a typical lament. Now the categories praise and lament are extremely broad, and together they embrace a large majority of the psalms in the Psalter. Usually scholars break those down into smaller, more specific types. For example, scholars usually distinguish not only between praise and lament, but also between individual psalms, in which just one poet speaks for himself or herself, and community psalms, which give voice to the praise and prayers of an entire group. Both praise and lament psalms come in individual and communal varieties. One might also wish to take the communal songs of praise, for example, and break them down into smaller subgroups based on topic. 
For example, you might regard all the psalms that praise God for blessing the land and making it fruitful as agricultural fertility psalms that might be especially popular during the harvesting seasons. There's a group of psalms called Psalms of Ascents, which seem to be pilgrimage songs sung while marching to Jerusalem for a festival. And then there's a group called the Songs of Zion, which praise God and celebrate God's special relationship with Zion, which is a poetic name for the city of Jerusalem. Praise and lament psalms together make up around two-thirds or more of the Psalter, depending on how certain psalms are categorized. The remainder of the psalms form smaller, but not necessarily less interesting groups. Some scholars like to distinguish psalms of confidence, which express a general trust in God, from hymns of praise, which focus more on God's attributes than on the worshiper's feeling of trust. Psalms 15 and 24 bear certain resemblances to praise psalms, but they seem particularly well suited to providing structure for a communal worship experience, and so many scholars refer to these as liturgies or liturgical psalms. Those psalms that focus on the king of Israel or Judah are called royal psalms. And let's try not to get these mixed up with enthronement psalms, which praise God as the king of the whole world. Psalm 45 is one of my favorite royal psalms. It's explicitly labeled a love psalm. Psalm 45 appears to have been written and used to celebrate royal weddings. And psalms like Psalm 1 and 37, which try to teach people how to live, are called wisdom psalms or didactic, that is, teaching psalms. Now this video has really only scratched the surface of understanding the psalm categories. To go further, you could pick up any good scholarly commentary on the Psalter, and you should find there a discussion of the psalm categories as that commentator perceives them. But even with the simple method I just presented, you can begin to identify psalm groups for yourself. Just read through the psalms and begin to gather together psalms that seem to you similar in tone. Read each psalm within the context of other psalms that you've gathered with it, other psalms of its type, to see the typical features of the category and the unique features of each individual psalm. And then try to imagine the kinds of life situations that might arise in which people would want to pray or sing a psalm like the ones that you have grouped together. And look for typical life situations, situations that would arise over and over again, and could explain why ancient believers preserved and reused these poetic expressions of praise, prayer, and piety.